In the internet age, myth can often be confused with reality. I, I think in the 2016 presidential election, we saw that in, in, in gross evidence. I, I remember uh, candidate Trump uh, claiming that our economy was in such doldrums that there were more people out of work than ever before, when in point of fact, unemployment was at historic lows, less than 5% across the country. Yet he managed to convince the majority of the electorate that he was right. Today, we are looking at issues concerning gun safety, and we are hearing from people on the right that there is an individual right to own a machine gun or a handgun under the Second Amendment. Having been a constitutional law professor for more than eight years, I can tell you that the only people who believe that are people who don't know anything about the Second Amendment or don't care to learn. That myth, however, has become reality. I remember when I would teach a class on the Second Amendment, I would ask the class, how many people have heard of the term, the right to bear arms? And every hand in the class would go up. And then I would ask, how many people have heard the phrase, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state? How many people have heard that? And my guess is that even the people in this room haven't heard that, but that actually is the beginning of the Second Amendment, which explains why it doesn't have anything to do with individual rights. It's all about states' abilities to protect their citizens. My point simply is that in the internet age, myths can become reality if we're not careful. And in this particular fight, there are many myths. Uh, first among them is the notion that you cannot fight City Hall or that developers and institutions always win, or that projects like this one are a done deal. Uh, the reality is that this is not a done deal. You can fight City Hall. Developers and institutions don't always win. In fact, they frequently nowadays lose. Uh, Bill mentioned a few of them, but I'll just uh, mention them again for emphasis. Uh, we saved the stacks and the research materials at the New York Public Library which the developers were planning on. They were planning on taking the books and moving them to New Jersey and removing the stacks permanently. These stacks were institutions within the library created with rare Carnegie steel that cannot be recreated today. Had they removed the stacks and the books, they could never have been returned. We were hired by a group of Pulitzer Prize winning authors and academics who told us they needed these books. So we fought and we won. We saved Central Park from an expansion by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The all-powerful Metropolitan Museum of Art wanted to expand into Central Park and eliminate precious green space, not unlike what's happening here. We sued the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and we forced them to abandon that plan, just like we forced the, muse the, the library to abandon its plan. The oldest clock tower of its kind left in the world is located at 346 Broadway. A developer with close ties to the de Blasio administration convinced the Landmarks Preservation Commission that they should close it off and convert it into a residential luxury condominium and the clock should be dismantled, which is a crazy notion. It was the last clock of its kind left in the world. So we sued the Landmarks Preservation Commission and we beat the Landmarks Preservation Commission. We also sued to, to preserve the First Church of Christ Scientists, which is a landmark property on 96 in Central Park West. Someone convinced the Landmarks Preservation Commission that it'd be okay to convert this beautiful building into luxury condominiums. We brought a matter before the Board of Standards and Appeals and we obtained a reversal. And today, the First Church of Christ scientist is going to remain a landmark untouched by the developers. And we sued, and I shouldn't say we sued, we didn't have to. We stopped the conversion of the rooftop of the Hopper Gibbons House, which is the last intact shelter point of the Underground Railroad left in Manhattan today. We prevented that, it, the escape route, the escape route used by runaway slaves from being converted into a luxury apartment. Believe it or not, the Landmarks Preservation Commission was seriously considering allowing a developer to place an apartment directly across the last escape route known left in Manhattan today. We beat that. And when the developer came back and tried a second time, we beat them again. My point is not so much to take credit, uh, but to share it, because I didn't do it alone. I had a lot of help. I had help from architectural historians, preservationists. I had help from scores, not scores, thousands of people. I could not have done it without their help. 
And the fact of the matter is, once I got their help, and I'm not talking so much about money, I'm talking about support, I'm talking about people standing together and fighting, and not being afraid to look this city hall in the eye and say, you know what, we can beat you. The fact of the matter is that we beat them. In the last seven land use zoning and preservation fights I've had, we've won five out of those seven. Out of the other two, one of them I was hired after the deal had, the deal had already been made, and the, the decision had already been made, so I was trying to get a reconsideration. I'm not even sure I should count that one. And, and the other one involves uh, a, Gan a Gansevoort community. There are two buildings in, in uh, Gansevoort that they're trying to convert into commercial high-rises. And um, on that one, the Supreme Court disagreed with us, and one might get discouraged after a loss like that because I really thought we should have won it. But the good news is that the appellate division, the first department, which is the next level of appeals court, uh, they were so impressed with the arguments that we made that they granted us an injunction pending appeal, something that happens in less than 5% of appeals. Exactly. <laughs> I have every confidence that we're gonna win that case too, which will bring my batting average to somewhere around 90%. Uh, I'll take that any day of the week. Um, the fact of the matter is these cases can be won and in, 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 in these circumstances, they should be won. Certainly this is a case that should be won. So the first message I'm going to give you tonight is that this is a case that can be won and should be won. So let's not, let's not, take, uh, let's not take a step back. Let's keep moving forward as we have been and continue the fight to preserve Teddy Roosevelt Park. Now the last time I addressed uh, a group like this, although I think it was a bit larger than this one, we talked about what our arguments were, and they have not changed, but they have some, matured somewhat because we found out more information. Uh, as Bill pointed out, um, we retained, or I say you retained, uh, an organization called GHD Consulting Group. Now, um, Bill referred to it as a world-renowned environmental consulting firm, and he's right, but I just want to give a few more details. GHD is a consulting firm, an environmental consulting firm, that has 130 offices across six continents across the world. This is not a small organization. This is a large organization. What is remarkable, however, is that they do not have a very strong presence in New York, so they owe allegiance to no developers here. They are the perfect environmental consulting firm to work with, because we know that they're gonna be objective. If they're gonna tell us, that this is an okay project, and that's what they're gonna tell us, if that's the truth. If, however, it's a poorly conceived, dangerous project, they tell us that too. So we asked them for a report, and they gave us one. And the report was startling. Uh, Bill talked about a few of the uh, chemical compounds that were found in the ground. Those include benzene, trichloroethylene, um, uh, lead paint, asbestos. Um, there were underground storage tanks with presumably with levels of gasoline in them, all of which could be released the minute they start to break ground. That's a very serious thing. I don't live in this neighborhood, although I wish I did. Um, but I'll tell you, I lived in proximity to a site that for all intents and purposes could become like a waste site. I sure as heck wouldn't want that project to move forward. And that's what we're looking at here. You're talking about serious chemical compounds being released into the air and not at some manufacturing facility, but into a park. Which, by the way, after the work is done, they're gonna expect you to walk back in with your kids and your strollers and your dogs and your cats. Well, maybe not cats, but dogs for sure. Uh, and, and my point to you is, the last thing anybody wants here, uh, I should say, the last thing anyone in here wants to happen, I can't speak for the museum, is for people to get hurt and sick. And that's the sort of thing that does happen when these environmental issues are glossed over, as this appears to be, have been done by the museum. The museum is using an environmental firm I deal with all the time. Uh, this environmental firm has never seen a project sponsored by a developer that this environmental firm didn't love. They always, and I mean always, support the projects. That's just the way it works. Now there's a flaw with the State Environmental Quality Review Act which allows this to happen. Amazingly, uh, under, under our laws, developers or institutions that want to engage in construction like this, they get to hire the expert, and then they get to use that expert to try to justify their projects. What should happen is the city should hire an independent expert, you know, kind of like the one we hired, or that you hired, uh, and then come up with an independent determination, but that's not what happens, and that's certainly not what happened here. So AKRF said, no problem. 
I'll give you an example of one of their no problem issues. And Bill talked about this too. Bill, you stole a lot of my thunder, man. So one of the things that um, they talked about is that the project is only going to result in an increase of 630,000 visitors a year. I say only because I know that's a lot of people, but let me tell you something. It's not going to be close to that number. It's going to be a lot more, at least two and a half times by, the, by GHD's estimate. And, the re and when we looked behind that number, 630,000, we tried to find out why it was that AKRF was concluding that this is, a, this is just a handful of people going to show up. Uh, and the answer they, ca they came up with, okay guys, listen, um, I'm not into alternate dispute resolution with pets. No worries, no worries. Very cute book. I guess everyone's really charged up about this. So, um, so 630,000 people, what, what AKR have said was that um, projects that are comparable to this one have resulted in approximately the same number of additional visitors. I have no idea what other comparable projects they were referring to, but my guess is there weren't any. There aren't any. The other point that I would make is that the museum took great pains to sell this plan to the city and to all of you by arguing that the Gilder Center was going to become a world-class institution and part of the American Museum of Natural History. It's going to increase visitors because it's so amazing, and yet at the same time they're saying it's only going to be 630,000 people. No. This is going to be a much more significant increase in the pedestrian traffic and vehicular traffic. Try to think about what it will mean to add 1.5 million additional visitors per year, increasing the number of visitors to this museum by 32%. Bill talked about a Times Square effect out here. I think that's an understatement. It's going to be a disaster out there. And when we're talking about visitors, we're talking about not just people walking in through the park, because if that's all it was, well, that would be terrible it wouldn't be a calamity. What I'm really concerned about is the additional vehicular traffic, the buses idling in front of the, of the Gilder Center on Columbus Avenue, cars double parked to drop people off, and the American Museum of Natural History is not really making any accommodation for that because from their perspective, it's just that much of a, not that much of an increase. So in addition to the construction impacts I mentioned earlier, benzene, asbestos, lead paint, underground storage house, Trichloroethylene, we're also talking about an increase in pedestrian traffic, foot traffic, vehicular traffic in front of your museum and all over your park. So we're talking about significant environmental impacts. Now, those are just two e examples of the 21 areas of environmental concern that have to be evaluated here, but they're representative of the whitewash that AKRF is guilty of when we discuss the environmental assessment that was provided. I'll tell you something else that deeply concerns me about this project from an environmental perspective, and that is that we are not seeing the final environmental impact statement. We were told that it would be released before November. That's an important date when you think about what happens in the first week of November, right? You would think that everyone in the city, certainly everyone in this area, wants to know what that environmental impact statement says before they walk into the ballot box and vote for their representatives and who they vote for for mayor. But they've delayed it. We were in contact with the Parks Department today, and the response we got was, it's coming out soon. What does soon mean? We heard soon in August. We heard soon in September. We're talking about them purposely delaying the release of the final environmental impact statement to diminish its political impact and to prevent you from having a fully informed judgment when you walk into the ballot, into the ballot box and cast your votes in November. We are urging the city of New York to require a release of the final environmental impact statement as soon as possible so that all of you can make a decision on your own to ascertain whether or not you want to support the administration that's supporting this project. Because make no mistake about it, the de Blasio administration is supporting this project. The other thing I want to talk to you about in addition to the environmental concerns are certain contractual issues. Now you might think to yourself, what are the contracts concerning the American Museum of Natural History have to do with me. Well, in 1877, the uh, city entered into a contract with the then budding museum. And the museum was given the right to construct buildings on a specific plot of property and its appurtenances. 
Now, appurtenance is, is not really a term that's used very much today, unless you're a real estate uh, person, a real estate lawyer, you're not just an ordinary person. Unless you're a real estate person, appurtenances doesn't really have a great meaning to you. Um, back in 1877, we, we, we got, got hold of a number of uh, old American dictionaries to see what appurtenances was intended to mean back then. Because if the museum has the right to build throughout the park, we'd have big problems. But if they were limited to their plot of land plus appurtenances, well, they were already on their plot of land, so what does appurtenances mean? That's what we have to find out. So I looked at these uh, dictionaries, and they all say the same thing, and then I found out an 1876 court decision which specifically addressed what appurtenances mean. Appurtenances meant in 1877 um, use access rights. So what does that mean? Well, try to imagine if you lived in a house, I mean, some of you may live in houses, and you have a driveway, and the driveway cuts across a piece of sidewalk, right? That sidewalk, that piece of sidewalk, you don't own it. The city owns it. So how can you have the right to go across that sidewalk all the time? Well, that's an appurtenance to your house. It is something you need to use in order to access your property. So when you think about Teddy Roosevelt Park, you know those pathways that lead to the museum? Those are the appurtenances that the museum got. Appurtenances are for use only. They are not for possession. They are not to build on. You have to be able to traverse an appurtenance in order for it to be an appurtenance. You can't put a building on an appurtenance. So they have no right to extend beyond their envelope, beyond their, their building boundaries. They are allowed to use the appurtenances, namely those pathways, just like all of you are, by the way. Okay, but they can't build on them. If they were to build on them, they need to get special permission. If they want special permission, they have to go to the city. If they want to get this special permission from the city, they have to comply with ULERP, which is a Uniform Land Use Review Procedure. Some reason someone thought that ULERP was a great acronym for that. It probably should have been something better, but in any event, the bottom line is ULERP is a multi-phase, lengthy, 12 to 18 month process by which determinations are made as to whether or not uh, city-owned land should be transferred to private development, and that would include the American Museum of Natural History. They have not complied with Euler, and they have not complied with the 1877 agreement. So we have environmental issues, and we have this 1877 agreement. So in my view, we have a strong, strong case here. I would love to see this case come to fruition, assuming we can't beat it at the administrative level. When I say that, I mean Hopefully, I, I think it's unlikely, but hopefully they come back with a final environmental impact statement and say, whoops, you know what, you're right. We totally blew it. But I don't see that happening because AKRF doesn't do that. So we need to keep moving forward if we want to have any chance of protecting this park. And that means continuing to make the arguments that we've been developing over the last, what is it, now it's almost a year now we've been working on this. Uh, and and so hopefully, if, for, if afforded the opportunity, will be able to make these arguments and make this case the next success made on behalf of the people of the city of New York. And if you think about it, that's what all these cases are about. The Metropolitan Museum of Art expanding into Central Park was about you. It was about protecting Central Park for you. Protecting the clock tower at 346 Broadway, that interior landmark that they were going to close off for luxury developments. Interior landmarks are here for you. They are specifically properties that are available to the public for viewing. And if it had been converted into a luxury apartment, none of you would ever be able to see that, that clock. And while you might not think it's that important, it's the only clock to tower of its kind left in the world today. It's an important clock. Hopper Gibbons, that decision was for you, so that you all could see what the last intact shelter point of the Underground Railroad is. That case was for you. The First Church of Christ Scientist case, that case was for you too. You have the right to continue looking at these amazing, amazing landmark properties. And just think for a second about what New York City would look like if we didn't have our landmarks. If they could suddenly be sold off to the highest bidder. What would Central Park look like if they started selling off properties for development? Now some of you might say, that could never happen. Has anyone been to the Brooklyn Bridge Park? Because the Brooklyn Bridge Park has apartments in it and has a hotel in it. Believe me, not only can it happen, I'm telling you right now, October 11, 2017, it's going to happen unless we stand up and we fight to preserve our properties, our landmarks, because ultimately our landmarks in the city, our precious properties in the city, our parks, really represent the soul of the city. And if we lose that, 
We are threatened with becoming something like Las Vegas, and I'm not talking about the shooting. I'm talking about what Las Vegas is. It's a nice place to go to, but it's not New York City. The culture there is what? Glitz and, and, and gambling. Uh, Shanghai is, a, is an amazing city. You're gonna find a park in Shanghai? Every building goes up to the sky. There's lights everywhere. There are skyscrapers everywhere. There are luxury buildings everywhere, but there are no parks. There's no soul to it. New York City is an amazing place. New York City has Chinatown, has Harlem, has Brooklyn Heights, has these amazing enclaves. And at the same time, we have Times Square, and we have the Financial District, and we have Chelsea. It's an amazing consolidation of diverse and eclectic neighborhoods. And the only way we're gonna keep that is if we fight for them. Because I'm telling you now, the city of New York, led by this administration, and I'm not making a political speech, I think we all know how the election is likely to come out. Although you're certainly free to change that if you can. Um, but the fact of the matter is this administration is committed to development. And the developers are committed to development. Developers don't care about landmarks. They just don't. I mean, you can't blame a cheetah for chasing down a deer. You can't blame a developer for wanting to knock down a building and put up an expensive one. They're doing it for the money, but it's up to the city and us to protect what we know is important like our neighborhoods, like our landmark properties, and like our parks, like Teddy Roosevelt Park. So I urge you all to, to continue this fight and to continue to stand with Bill and members of the Community United to really fight for this because it's worth fighting for. I believe in it. I believe most of the people here, if not all of you, believe in the same fight, and the people of this neighborhood believe in it. So hopefully you guys will continue it. I'm glad to be there with you. As long as you guys are working with me, I'll be glad to work for you because I do love Teddy Roosevelt Park and I want to protect it. Thank you very much.